Welcome to this video on publishing from your thesis. My name is Cecile Bardenhorst and I'm in the adult and post-secondary units in the Faculty of Education at Memorial University. What I want to go through in this presentation is to show you how to use your thesis as a source for publishing. So one of the questions people always ask is how can I publish from my thesis? What I want to do is um, take you through the difference between uh, a journal um, a journal audience and a thesis audience because when you write the thesis you're writing a particular kind of document and when you write a journal article it's you're writing a different document. So a thesis is constructed around um, assessment. You're writing to meet specific academic requirements and your readers will be either your supervisor or examiners chosen by your supervisor or the university. And the purpose is assessment. So the literature review has to show depth and breadth of reading for assessment purposes. So you might need to read a lot more or around your topic um, and not focus it tightly as you would in a journal article. So in a thesis, you read quite deeply because you're trying to show your examiners that you've read widely and deeply. The thesis is organized into chapters, there's lots of detail and you need to explain everything. So if you use a concept, you have to explain what that concept means and often trace its roots. There's often a lot of repetition because it's a lengthy document, you have to repeat the problem purpose statement, the argument, so on. And often you don't get a word limit, you know, some universities do stipulate word limits for a thesis but often you can just write as much as you want, um, which is, you know, it's much harder when you've got word limits. And then you present all the findings, you know, or most of the findings that you, um, from your analysis. Now, when we look at the characteristics of journal articles, we can see that it's actually quite different. So the audience are often specialists, but they can be wider specialists in the sense that it's a wider audience. It's not just your supervisor and a few examiners in this one little area. So although your readers might be in the field, they may not be directly in your little area of the field. The, um, the, the, the article that you submit will also be reviewed by peers who are experts in the field and blind peer review, so they are also your audience. Um, and when you present the, a literature review for an article, it's really quite succinct and it's, it's focused around that topic. You don't have to put in any sources to show you've read them or that you understand the broader issues. It's really quite focused. The journal article is organized into sections and the sections are relatively short. Only relevant details are explained. So you don't have to explain things to show you know what they mean. You have to, whatever you put in has to relate to that particular topic. So all the sections are shorter, there are strict word limits, and this can be quite difficult to deal with. And then you might only present selected findings that are relevant to the arguments in that specific paper. So let's go back to the thesis, let's look at the thesis audience. What they're looking for is, you know, have you developed the skills to conceptualize a doable research project and then put it into operation? Do you understand research techniques in your field? Can you apply those techniques? Have you read widely and deeply in your field? Can you engage in analysis, synthesis and draw conclusions? Can you sustain a developed, uh, can you develop a sustained argument? And can you counter arguments against or objections to your arguments. So you can see all of these are assessment related questions. Um, you know, uh, with a master's or a PhD, your examiners are seeing whether or not you meet the requirements of that degree. With a journal audience, it's completely different because they don't have to be there. So a journal audience is looking for, is this interesting? Is this something I haven't seen before? Is it original? Is the author putting forward an interesting argument that's new to me? How does this research fit in the research literature? So as a reader, I want to know 
How does this author think that this research fits into the research literature? Who is this author aligning with theoretically? What methodology was used and why? And is this methodology interesting to me and my work? What did the author find? What conclusions did the author draw? Are there interesting conclusions to me and my work? Do they change the way I think about an issue uh, or the issue at hand, the topic that's being researched? And how has the author dealt with counter-arguments because I might have some of those counter-arguments myself? Your thesis is like this forest. You've got many, many trees in the forest. Your paper is like one tree. So your, what I'm trying to get at by looking at these different audiences is that you write papers for a specific audience. You construct it, you tailor it, you shape it for that audience. It's very difficult to take a thesis that was shaped for a particular audience and then just cut and paste uh, and produce a new paper for a completely different audience. Because the text has to talk to ways to readers in ways they find familiar and acceptable. So you have to shape the paper to that particular audience. So rather than... Um, trying to reduce your thesis into a paper, what I'm going to argue for here is that you construct new papers and then you just mine your thesis. You take what you need from the thesis for the new paper. But now, um, all right, let's go through it. So what does this mean? So it means that you use your thesis as a source text and you write new papers. What I found is that people often get stuck when they're trying to publish from their papers because they're trying to take that whole big thesis that was written for a, for a different purpose and reduce it to one single paper. And, and that is almost an impossible task, and that's why people get stuck. So it's much easier if you conceptualize a new paper and then you extract the bits you need and then rewrite uh, this completely new paper for this new audience. And it sounds like it would take a lot more time and would be more difficult to do this, but actually it isn't. It, it will save you hours and hours of trying to squash that forest into one tree. So what I would suggest is you do a bit of planning beforehand, and that planning will involve how many papers can I write from this thesis? So plan to write multiple papers. Look for things like different research questions in the thesis, different aspects, different conclusions that could, conform, that could form a coherent paper on its own. Um, so really what you're doing is you're looking for the smaller stories within that big story. So each paper will be reconceptualized and tell its own story. In other words, it must be coherent around its own specific question and problem. So you're finding these smaller stories within the bigger story of your thesis. And you're choosing your smaller stories based on the availability of evidence in your thesis and the argument being made. So you might be able to write two coherent papers but for a third paper, you might need to add a bit more literature or, um, you know, add to it in order to make it coherent because it wasn't something that was fully formed in your thesis. The thing you want to focus on is a single message for each of these papers. So all the other messages fall into the background and this single message becomes the foreground of this particular paper. And you can have a narrow specialization in whatever research project you're looking at. You could be looking at something that's specific in terms of time or geography or topic. But you can approach it from a wide variety of perspectives. So you could do a paper on the methodology of that particular narrow specialization. You could um, do a paper on the literature review or the knowledge gap or an argument around where research should go. You could take one finding out of a set of um, larger findings or a set of smaller findings, one set of findings within your bigger set of findings. Um, you could focus on theory, 
perhaps you have an original take on a theory and you could write a paper around that. So there you're not focusing on the narrow specialization as such, but you're talking about how to look at this narrow specialization through theory. Perhaps through doing your research, you came to a new understanding of the primary data or the secondary sources, and that's what you can focus your paper on. But whatever you, you're doing, you want to have a central focus for each paper. And, you know, what I would suggest is that you plan these papers. You choose the most relevant paper to work on first, so that once you have that published, you can then refer to that paper and cite it as you move forward. So that you're building this body uh, and you don't have to keep going back and explaining everything. You can say, well, I discussed this in this paper. Have a look there. Okay. Um, so you can sequence the papers um, and, and then build this body of work from your thesis. The most important thing in telling the smaller story is framing the paper. And that is finding the angle. So this means approaching your topic from a particular angle that will suit the journal and will interest the journal readers. So this is where you try and make it interesting for readers. And, and really what you're doing with this is you're making decisions. You're making all these decisions about what to select from your thesis, what you think will work around the smaller story. Will I be able to provide enough evidence for my data? The framing means that you're taking, uh, you know, what, what is this huge project where you've done all this painstaking research and you're now extracting these seamless arguments and narratives, these, these little stories in papers of their own. So just to give you an example of framing, here's a paper where I thought the framing was fantastic. So it's called Charlemagne's Peaches, a case of early medieval European ecological adaptation. So now this author could have called it early medieval European ecological adaptation, or he could have called it uh, fruit trees in early medieval European ecological adaptation. But he's framed it around peaches. And the framing of Charlemagne's peaches is what piques our interest, because he's making a connection there that is interesting. Um, so, yeah, you could say, you know, you could tell this story in a very boring way where you say, well, you know, there were a lot of fruit trees and these fruit trees are an indication of Charlemagne's imperial aspirations. But by framing it around Charlemagne's peaches, you, you really are sparking an interest because of that. So um, that's what you want to do with each of your papers, is you want to find some way of framing it that is interesting, that takes only a small slice of that thesis, and that you have enough data to um, support, where you can say something interesting. So where to begin? Um, you know, I would do a brainstorming session. I've said here, write, write down three to five, but I would say write down as many interesting points from your thesis as you can think about. There could be points from the literature review. There could be points from the methodology. There could be points from the theory that you've applied. And there could be conclusions. And think about whether you've got enough in there to, in your thesis, to create papers around each of these. Um, you don't have to write all the papers. You know, you might only want to write one or two papers from your thesis because you might be tired of it at this point. Um, but, um, you know, think broadly rather than trying to narrow it down quickly to one thing you can write about. So here's just one example, and this is from... Um, a master's thesis uh, written by Ben and um, he, he, this thesis was quite well organized so it's really easy to see how these three papers would work but in the in the thesis what Ben does is he looks at the presence of chickens and eggs in Frankish society and medieval society and he has an argument about chickens that really they were much more prevalent than we thought but he also has an argument about women, that women were involved in egg production. And he has another argument about how we see food um, and, and what food looked like at that time. So 
all, although these three arguments throughout the thesis are interwoven, he can extract them into three separate papers. And then he can frame it. So, for example, if we look at the woman in egg production, he could frame it emphasizing the woman, or he could frame it emphasizing the egg production and then bring woman into it um, subsequently. So the framing is what cap captures the audience's interest. So you need to think about that quite carefully. The next step, once you have um, a, a set of ideas of papers that you think you could develop, would be to create a problem purpose statement for each of these papers. Now, I would do them one at a time. <laughs> Um, but of course, you know, you might want to do them all at once to see what, you know, how, how you can separate them and uh, what you would find interesting to begin with. And each of these would just be one page to half a page. And I have a number of videos on how to develop the problem purpose statement. I'm just going to go through it very briefly here. So a sentence or two about the problem being investigated. And this is the real world rationale. So, you know, if, you, if you've noticed like a policy issue or well, if that's what your research is about or some kind of conflict or you're challenging some kind of conventional wisdom, um, that would be the problem. Then a sentence or two around the context, the time, the geography, who's involved, what's involved. The knowledge gap, what we don't know about this topic. And this is the academic rationale. So this is the need to do the research because this, we've, we're opening this gap that we don't know. Um, you might have a sentence or two around your arguments, if that's relevant, a sentence or two around the theoretical or conceptual framework, again, if that's relevant, a sentence on the purpose of this research, and you might add a couple of sentences on the methodology, whatever data you're going to collect. And then you might have a guiding research question framed as a question, and it really helps to organize your thinking, even if you don't use the question in the paper. Um, it really helps to organize your thinking if you do have a question, because it's one of those checks that you can do at the end of the paper, is to see whether or not you've addressed that question. So if you take a position on the problem, if you take a stand on the problem, that's generally your argument. So I just wanted to put that in there in case you were wondering what your argument was. <laughs> Once you have all those components, um, that then becomes the abstract for this paper. All you would need to do would be to add a couple of key findings, and that would be the abstract. So once you have that, you can send it off to a call for papers, if you come across a relevant call for papers, or a conference, if that's um, you know what you're planning to do. So the problem purpose statement is a really useful step because it helps you begin to, well, bring this paper into being. So just to show you some examples from published papers, and this in this example, Bland 2019, you can see the whole problem purpose statement in the abstract. Now, not all the components are here because sometimes they're not all relevant for your research. But I would say in the beginning, try and, and put all the components in and then work out what you don't need. So in this particular abstract, I'm just going to go on. Um, what happened to the many Mediterranean fruits the Romans brought to Northwest Europe? That's the first sentence. And what that really is, is the research question, the problem, and the knowledge gap all in one sentence. So we've got the question, the knowledge gap is that we don't know what happened to it, and the problem is around um, what happened to the Mediterranean fruits. Okay, if we go back, we'll look at the context. We know that it's in uh, Charlemagne's time, Northwest Europe, it's about fruit. So we've got a good sense of what this project's about. And that's the context. The argument is very clearly in here. The peach is an excellent proxy for Charlemagne's imperial and ecological aspirations. So that's the argu argument. The purpose of the research is in here. This article analyzes how adapting exotic plants to northern climates served the purposes of early medieval rulers. So it's very clear. It's not hidden what the purpose is. You can see what the purpose is there. And then the methodology is in there as well, using written and archaeobotanical uh, evidence. 
So that's all clear. Everything is clear. It's all in the abstract. And, you know, just to <laughs> emphasize the problem purpose statement as being a useful tool, it's useful for your own thinking when you're conceptualizing this paper and you're working out what to take from the thesis. But then again, it's also useful when you write the paper. It's useful to put in your abstract and in the introduction to the paper. So once you start writing, you, you will have already done all the difficult thinking and you can just put the problem purpose statements into your introduction. So here's an example again of um, a problem purpose statement in an introduction. So this is the same paper. Again, the purpose is there. This essay is about the early me medieval Carolingian dissemination of the peach. So it's very clear it's there. But the recent discovery at Rome raises pertinent issue about how archaeobotanical evidence reshapes scholarly understanding of pre-industrial food waste. There's the problem again. It's written differently. It's also the knowledge gap. Um, and then, you know, there's several things here. How demand stimulated pre-modern horticulture, how plants considered once considered exotic became native, and how enmeshed in power relations even innocuous fruits like peaches can be, as this discussion will show. So... Um, so all the components of the paper, the arguments, the knowledge gap, the problem, the context, the purpose, are all in the introduction. So you don't need to rethink that because you've already done it through the problem purpose statement. And just to give you another example of the kind of language around problem, uh, around knowledge gaps, um, indeed there's relatively little known about the early, about early medieval food and cooking. Most information on blah, 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 blah. Okay. So they're pointing out and then they're developing this argument of why there is this knowledge gap. Here's an example of a conceptual and theoretical framework, which may not be applicable to all studies, but certainly to many studies. Um, a functionalist approach is helpful in explaining what might otherwise seem to be meaningless or senseless behaviors. And then later on, structuralism applied to food studies and so on. So there the author is introducing the conceptual and theoretical framework, and this would appear in the introduction. Another example here of um, an argument. I aim to show how food consumption practices in the time of Charlemagne stood as markers of an aristocratic, masculine, and Christian community. So very upfront and open about the arguments, and that would have been in the introduction as well. So the problem, purpose, uh, the problem purpose statement and questions helps you to conceptualize each paper differently. So not totally differently, but each with their own focus and angle. And it will help you to think your way through this paper and then later on really help you to write. So what I'm saying essentially is that you're breaking up the writing process to a kind of planning thinking process through this problem purpose statement. Once you've got that worked out, you can move into a more consolidated writing process. And you'll find that it's much easier to write the paper if you've done that thinking beforehand. Now, in the beginning, when you're first developing the problem purpose statement, you know, just have conversations with yourself where you're saying, well, will this paper focus on this? How will this paper be different from the other papers that I'm planning to write? And then gradually refine it um, so that, you know, if you need to, you can show it to someone else. How you write up the problem purpose statement into the paper is honestly up to you. You don't have to put it in at all. But your reader is expecting those components in the problem purpose statement. All those components. Your reader is expecting them within the first two or three pages. If they don't appear in the first two or three pages, you'll get pushback uh, on that. So just some tips on mining your thesis. Um, you need to write for the journal audience. So you need to, you don't have to know the journal like really well, but you need to know some characteristics about it. That means you have to read papers from that journal. <laughs> um, some journals are highly specialized in a particular topic. Others are more cross-disciplinary and others are more general. And others might be a more disciplinary based, so they, then they have quite a wide audience. 
So why is this important? Well, it's important because you have to explain your concepts and terms and your argument differently for these different audiences. In a highly specialized audience, somebody who knows your topic really well, you, you probably wouldn't have to explain uh, why your argument is important, why your terms or your methodology is important. But the broader your audience, the more you have to explain that, the more you have to provide um, not only explanations but evidence for um, whatever it is that you're doing because they may not know that methodology, may, they may not know that argument, they may not understand the significance of what you're trying to do and you have to explain that. The same thing for like international journals. Uh, international journals have a much wider readership so you would then need to explain the context as well as explain all your concepts and your methodology and your argument much more uh, systematically. So that's why you need to think about the the audience. So in you know when you're publishing from your thesis, you might have one paper that's going to a highly specialized local journal and another paper that's going to a, a disciplinary international journal with a broad audience base. And you're going to have to write those two papers quite differently because of those audiences. So what to take from your thesis? Um, and the way I would begin doing this is to, in your notes, in your rough draft of your paper, I would put the headings that you would find in journals in that particular, in articles in that particular journal. So um, I'm putting the generic terms here, but if you look at the journal you want to publish in, you'll get a good sense of the types of headings that people use. And generally in research papers, they are organized around this kind of structure. So you would have the abstract, which we're not really going to talk about now. Then an introduction, a literature review section, and sometimes the literature review section is joined to the introduction. Then you would have a method section, um, and then some, some kind of body which would be where you present your data, or you explain your narrative and arguments, and this is where you provide the evidence. And then a section at the end where you draw conclusions and you discuss the data in relation to the literature. Well, you're really telling your reader the significance of the data and the analysis. So you might not use these headings, but even if you do use these headings, this will give you um, a rough kind of outline that you can begin to work from. And then maybe later on you can go and change the headings to something that's more relevant to your topic. Um, and then, of course, you, you'll be working with your problem purpose statement. So you'll put your problem purpose statement into the introduction and you're shaping that you, whatever you're taking from your thesis, you are taking in relation to this particular problem purpose statement. So there will be some pieces that will be relevant and others that won't and you'll have to leave them behind. Now, the thing is, you, you might be able to cut and paste from your thesis especially things like the methodology, you might be able to take bits and pieces. But overall, you're going to have to rewrite this and reshape this paper. So what I'm saying is that um, even though you cut and paste, and there might be quite a lot you can take from the thesis, somewhere along the line, you're going to have to sew this together in, in this new framing so that the paper becomes quite different. Pay attention to the journal specification. So if they have a particular word length, don't go over the word length. Uh, if they have a particular focus for the journal, make sure that you are meeting that focus. Look at their formatting and the headings and the referencing system. Look at the visuals. How do they present visuals? And pay attention to that when you are first compiling the paper. Um, I mean, you can do it at the end, but I always find it to be very tedious at the end. I just wanted to give you a few things I've learned about publishing um, throughout my career. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I would really focus on is to make your paper interesting. You know, um, there, there must be something that you found interesting about this research, otherwise you wouldn't have done it. So you want to convey that interest because your audience is asking, your reader is asking, why should I read this and why is this research important? So you want to answer that question, why should I read this, in the introduction. 
and then frame the paper for the journal audience. And, and really the way to do that is to read papers in the journal. And if you can, join conversations that have been started earlier. So that means refer to other papers in the journal and include them in your literature review and your arguments. Work out your argument beforehand so that it's clear in your own mind and you're not mixing things up halfway through the paper. Uh, and that's why that problem purpose statement is so useful. And then focus your writing around specific detailed writing rather than abstract vague writing because detailed writing is so much more interesting to readers. And, you know, the Charlemagne's peaches compared to Charlemagne's fruits very different story, right? You know, when you're thinking about Charlemagne's peaches, you get this image in your head about those peaches. And that's what detailed writing does for your audience. You know, don't be afraid to get help around publishing, to watch other videos to, on YouTube, to read books on um, how to publish in your field or how to write in your field. Speak to other people who have published, you know, other students or, uh, you know, other, your supervisor or other faculty members. Get feedback on your drafts. Um, finding a writing buddy, somebody that you can work with. They don't necessarily have to work on the same topic as you are, but somebody you can write alongside, you know, um, that you plan together and you set a time together and um, you can work, on, you can read each other's work, but you, you don't necessarily have to have an expert in your field as a writing buddy. Really what you want is somebody who's working on something on a paper themselves so that you're reaching all the milestones together and you can encourage each other to keep going. If I've learned anything from publishing, you must persevere. Don't uh, take peer review as a rejection. Peer review is really just uh, one of the things you have to get through. And often the peer review really improves the paper. So even though it's hard to take in the beginning and, and you know, I often get quite angry <laughs> when I get the reviews in, you know, give yourself some time and then go through them again and, and work through it systematically. And I have a number of videos on this as well. Um, but as long as it's not rejected outright, anything above uh, an outright rejection is a win. So even if they say revise and resubmit, I still think you've got two people or three people reading that paper, giving you lots of feedback. You can rework it and revise it. Um, you know, I've had many, well, I wouldn't say many, but I've had desk rejections for sure. And then I know I've sent it to the wrong journal so I send it off to another journal. I've had lots of revise and resubmits. And sometimes it's come back for a second revise and resubmit. Um, and in those cases, sometimes I'm trying something new. Um, and, you know, journals are often fairly conservative. They don't really want to take anything that deviates too much. And sometimes I've misread the, the journal. So... Um, then I'll have to think to myself, is it worth pursuing this or moving on to another journal? But you don't want to abandon the paper. That's what I'm saying. Because you've put a lot of work into this and um, you just want to work through the process of getting it published and try not to get caught up in feeling inadequate because it can make you feel like that. And just to remember that when you see a, final, a, 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 when you see a published paper, the final version, what you're seeing is the end point. You're not seeing all the tears and recriminations and rewriting and rewriting that went on in between. And although there have been times when I've really cursed the peer reviewers and felt like, you know, they were <laughs> being obstructive, in the end, the paper is always um, much better because you go through it so many times, of course it gets better. If you can, co-publish with somebody who has published before. Because even though I can sit here and tell you, you know, do this, do that, whatever. When you're working on a paper with someone who's published before, you'll learn a lot just from, you know, the planning stages, putting the paper together, the interactions, and then how to deal with the peer review. So if you have that opportunity, take advantage of it. Um, another one of the tips that I have lots of videos on as well is to separate the writing from editing. 
So don't begin your paper by editing. Rather, you know, collect all your bits and pieces, write and then edit because they are two different uh, ways of working. And if you begin with editing, you oftentimes will not get anywhere. Um, editing is the end point. So you need to start by letting go of editing, just getting everything down, shaping it, and then you can edit. And the last thing I want to say, because I'm going to draw a strong conclusion here, is to make sure in your papers that you draw strong conclusions. Now, I often find that um, people who are new to publishing, they just fade away at the end. And that's obviously because they're tired, they're tired of the paper. Um, but you want to make sure that in your conclusion, you are saying something that will stick in the reader's mind. So when I say draw strong conclusions, I'm saying that once you've completed your analysis of the data, you will come to findings. With those findings, you have to take a step back and develop meta conclusions. So these are kind of broader conclusions that, um, that your findings have led you to. And I, I'm always suggesting to find three meta conclusions. So in your paper, you would have um, your data analysis, you would come to findings, and then in the discussion section, you would begin with those findings, relate them back to the literature, and then come back to these three meta-conclusions. And this is what most readers find the, the most interesting of, of a paper, is what are you, you know, what conclusions did you draw after this whole process? So I just want to show you from this particular article um, of Charlemagne's Peaches and how you can, when I'm saying draw strong conclusions, I don't mean that you have to be dogmatic or um, you can't be uncertain. So I wanted to show you, because in this paper he's quite uncertain, but he's strongly uncertain. <laughs> and that's what you want. So... If you have a look at the sentence here, this reveals the striking parallels between the text and archaeological evidence. So he could have just said this reveals the parallels, but he's indicating to you that this is something worth noting. So by putting striking in there, it makes it stronger because he's really being quite forceful about this. And then down here he says, when all the written and material evidence is assembled and assessed, it seems almost certain so almost certain is quite uncertain, right? <laughs> but he's strongly uncertain in his certainty here. So he's saying, um, it seems almost certain, but look at this evidence. Look at all the evidence that I've provided you with. Um, that's what I'm talking about. He, you know, There are other parts of the paper where you can be more cautious, but in the conclusion, you want to leave your reader with something. And this, you know, something that you can say that the reader can take away with them. And that's why you need these strong conclusions. All right, that's my strong conclusion. Just remember, I have lots of other videos on um, thesis writing, on research writing, and a whole series on publishing a paper. So you might want to go and have a look at that series. And if you want a list of all my videos, then just send me an email. Otherwise, best of luck in your publishing and I hope you publish many papers from your thesis.